So welcome, Lynn June. It's a pleasure having you here. Um, please go ahead. Right. Thank you very much, Evgenia, for that very generous and kind introduction. And also thank Professor Kuhn for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I, I hope you're as excited as I am to, uh, to talk about some of the quantitative proteomics. And also, since this is a virtual format, I hope to use this opportunity to welcome you virtually to Madison. Um, actually, my background, even though I can't see it, I chose the uh, Memorial Union Terrace, so that's actually how it uh, looks like right now in the summer. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some of the strategies for quantitative proteomics. Uh, but before doing that, I thought it might be good to just give you a quick uh, overview of the, um, the standard kind of a bottom-up proteomics workflow using mass spectrometry. You've heard uh, a lot these two days and also this morning, there are uh, different data acquisition and data analysis. So depending on your sample of interest, you can start with cell culture or piece of tissue. Uh, for example, the cell, you can lyse them, extract proteins, and then throw in different enzymes such as trypsin or GLU-C or whatever you like, your favorite enzymes and digest them into pieces followed by fractionation. And if you're interested in a particular PTN, uh, you can use, for example, IMAC to enrich phosphor or lectin <clears throat> to enrich uh, glyco uh, proteins, and then followed by nanoflow LC-MS-MS. So shown on the bottom is like a typical MS1 precursor scan. At any given uh, LC elution time, you have multiple peaks, and then you can actually, based on the relative abundance, you can select these signs to do tendon mass spec fragmentation to get uh, protein identification using a variety of software and informatic tools. So these days we can get uh, to thousands of proteins from a single uh, shotgun proteomic experiments. However, for biologists, a lot of times we also want to know uh, what, how these different proteins change their relative expression pattern. Uh, the quantitative proteomics become more and more important. So there's a nice review article by Professor Yitz a few years back, summarized some of these major uh, strategies for quantitative proteomics uh, from a 2D gel-based approach um, and then mass spec based approach. That's what we're going to focus today. And within this, there are also label-free relative quantification or using stable isotope labeling strategies. And this can be further divided into absolute quantification and relative quantification. And within this category, we can also divide them into MS1-based quantification and MS2-based quantification. There is a, actually just uh, earlier this month, there's a nice uh, review article from uh, <clears throat> uh, a mass spec review um, that summarized some of these chemical isotope labeling strategies for quantitative proteomics in ranging from MS1-based quantification where we can introduce light and heavy isotope tags and then based on their, for example, relative iron abundance uh, with this uh, extracted iron chromatogram to relative quantify proteins from two different samples. Or you can use this MS2-based quantification strategies. And within this, we have reporter iron, uh, based approach or fragment ion based approach. And we're going to focus, uh, uh, talk several of these uh, different approaches uh, today. So now if we step back to think about uh, protein quantification, relative versus absolute quantification. If we consider, for example, a matrix like this, it would have five samples and five proteins. When we talk about relative quantification, what we're really referring is to comparing quantity of a protein across different samples. For example, if we want to look at a specific uh, protein number two across different samples, one to five, and we can maybe uh, you know, conclude that, for example, in sample three, there are nine times uh, more of this uh, protein two uh, compared to uh, sample one. And for absolute quantification, we're more focusing or getting the absolute abundance or concentration of a protein within a sample. So for example, again, if we focus on sample three and we can look at the, uh, the, the actually the absolute abundance of proteins or amount of proteins one through five and how much uh, they are in those. So we have different strategies. We can perform uh, relative quantification 
And this uh, is a nice uh, schematic from the Kuhn group looking at MS1-based quantification. Uh, for example, we have label-free quantification, and that's just uh, sequentially compare two different sample, two different LCMS run, and align their LC retention time and look at the area under curve. And also another big category is the metabolic labeling. For example, you can culture your cells in light and heavy uh, isotope uh, media. For example, you can add heavy lysine like A Dalton uh, heavier or arginine six plus uh, Dalton heavier. And for every new protein synthesized, it will incorporate these uh, lysine or arginine. And during the digestion process, all of your peptides, uh, the, uh, these two samples, when you combine them and do a single uh, LCMS analysis, so then you can compare their relative abundance based on the area under curve. And then there is also a big category of chemical labeling, and we're going to uh, look at them uh, uh, in a greater detail later uh, in the lecture. So again, you have, for example, formaldehyde is a, one of the common use uh, chemical labeling approach. Um, you can, again, this is the mass difference labeling. You have light and heavy comparison. And another big category is the MS2 quantification, also known as isobaric labeling. And this can allows you to do a multiplex quantification. And basically, based on its name, the quantification occur at the second stage of MS. So you can differentially label multi-sets of sample and combine them in MS1. So there's no spectral complexity introduced. And then the second stage, MS or MSMS, would allow you to quantify these different uh, protein relative abundance based on their reporter ion ratio. So let's start with the simplest one, the label free quantification. Obviously, there's no label uh, added. So in some way, this is the minimum or the simplest in terms of sample preparation. Um, and showing here is one of the example. For example, we can look at a peptide species from the first run and the second run and you can align them based on, for example, this is an isotope cluster of a particular uh, peptide species. You can look at their LC retention time and align them and uh, compare them uh, between different ratios. And you heard wonderful lecture from uh, Jorgen Cox this morning in using, for example, uh, max uh, LFQ, you can relative quantify these uh, for label-free quantification. So in some way, these are uh, in general more uh, computationally expensive. Uh, however, they can actually allow you to look at much larger, broader dynamic range. Uh, and also, there's no limit on the number of samples. So you can look at one over uh, 200 or, or even a thousand proteins. Uh, what we're looking at is basically the chemically identical uh, peptides compare from run to run. And one thing you pro probably would recognize is would rely on substantial instrument time. Um, so another way to look at label-free quantification besides this area under curve is the MSMS or spectral counting approach. So this is based on the hypothesis when you have higher abundance of a protein and you have more uh, number of these triptych peptides and that can be actually translated to a larger number of MSMS spectra. So you can count the number of spectral and then uh, infer the relative abundance of these protein, uh, uh, abundance of the proteins. So here again, some of the, uh, the drawback is that you, from run to run, you may have these variation that requires better, more stable uh, LC retention time. And this also requires, as I mentioned, a lot of instrument time and oftentimes more sophisticated software for peak alignment and normalization. So today we're going to uh, look at spend more time to look at stable isotope labeling for quantitative proteomics. As we mentioned, there are three different big categories. One is the metabolic uh, labeling so that you can uh, culture cells or feed animal with uh, heavy isotope fed, um, and then the other way so this is uh, happening at the very beginning or the protein stage for extraction and all the downstream workflow and the isotope tagging by chemical reaction and this can happen both at the protein level or at the peptide level and we're going to talk more about this and then there are another a third strategy which uh, now used a little bit less is the stable isotope incorporation during enzymatic uh, reactions for example we can digest the two protein populations 
in the presence of one uh, sample or condition in the presence of uh, heavy water, O18 water, and this would generate, for example, tripic peptide with the C-terminal incorporate with um, heavy isotopes. So in general, if we think about these different isotopic labeling strategies, essentially we are introducing an internal standard to this, uh, basic the label is kind of a, acting as an internal reference. Um, so there are uh, uh, ICAT labeling, that's one of the earlier um, um, development, and I'll talk a little bit about this, and also the metabolic labeling. It could be heavy stable isotopes like M15 or carbon-13, or these uh, heavy amino acids. And this in general will offer higher protein coverage, uh, some of the downside is that the limitation that you have to either grow the cell, so only work for cell in culture, or uh, animal, uh, you can feed the animal with uh, this more expensive isotopes. And also the digestion in O18 water I just talked about with trypsin. And also there is a big category for different peptide derivatization with either N-terminal or C-terminal um, after tryptic digest. So as we Mass spectrometry is actually, we know that in nature, there are actually a, a great variety of these stable isotopes. So in some way, these uh, stable isotopes are really the gift for our mass spectrometrists because we can utilize some of these stable isotopes to, uh, to increase the chemical information that we can extract from our sample. And in the context of protein quantification, we can use this to design chemical tax to help us to perform uh, more accurate quantification. So I like to use carbon as an example. Obviously, we know that the most abundant uh, carbon, uh, the uh, presence of uh, carbon in nature is uh, C12, and that's uh, uh, occupy 98.9%. However, the carbon-13, which have an extra uh, neutron has 1.1% um, abundance. So you may think that's not much, but when you think about a bigger a size molecule like a peptide and protein, this C13 peak can become actually quite appreciable um, and that correspond to this kind of a isotope clusters where we actually can utilize for uh, both peptide and protein identification, but also quantification. So here we're looking at a triptych peptide is a doubly charged peptide. The black one is actually the light version, the natural abundance um, Isotope and then the heavy um, isotope is the, this is the uh, C13 isotope. So for this, we can see that during the LC retention time or the LC elution peak, we can actually sample at multiple points and generate this kind of an extracted ion chromatogram to get the relative the abundance of this black peptide. And then the red one uh, is which is four Dalton heavier uh, than this uh, light version. And this, uh, again, we can sample at multiple locations, and this would give us the uh, extracted ion chromatogram is 85% of relative abundance. So we can extract quantitative data from this uh, kind of uh, information. So there are several ways that we can incorporate isotopes, as I mentioned, the metabolic labeling, you can do cell culture or animals like the fruit fly, you can uh, feed them in heavy uh, isotope or uh, glucose or other kind of things, and then combine, um, combine them and do digestion. Another two ways for chemical labeling, sometimes uh, this is at the either protein level, so you can um, label them with uh, stable isotopes and then combine them at a protein level and then do digestion. Alternatively, you can extract proteins from these two different cell states and then do digestion. And so now you have triptych peptide and then isotope labeling, uh, combine them uh, and do relative quantification. So this actually brings up a very interesting uh, consideration when you select different methods and you design your quantitative proteomics experiments is to think about at what stage you incorporate your stable isotopes. So showing here is a general uh, labeling workflow for uh, quantitative proteomics from cells or tissues, and then extract and purify it in uh, uh, fractionation. And then you have these proteins and then digest them into peptides and mass spec sampling. So on the, the blue box, the blue and yellow represent two different cell conditions or biological states that you want to compare the relative abundance of these uh, proteins. 
And then obviously we can introduce these uh, isotopes at different stage. Uh, the very early stage is the metabolic labeling. As you can see, this is actually the very beginning. And this horizontal line basically shows that what stage you combine these two samples, the light and heavy, for example. And so obviously from this plot, you can see, or this uh, schematic, you can see that the metabolic labeling is the least prone to errors because every steps of these sample processing uh, errors or uh, um, differences or variances have been accounted for. And if you look at, at the protein level, for example, here, we combine these uh, this isotope at the protein level, like for example, ICAT, or at the peptide level, if we use the triptych digest peptide with um, formaldehyde labeling light and heavy. So there are multiple steps, actually, these are uncompensated. So these are the things that you need to consider uh, when you design your experiments. So now if we look at, uh, as we mentioned, the metabolic labeling or sometimes also initially known as stable isotope labeling with immune access in cell culture known as SILAC is uh, considered as the most accurate in, in many uh, methodology because it start from the very beginning of your workflow, so culture cells. For example, here we can culture in the light and heavy arginine, so there's six dolphins apart for each of the peptide containing a, a single arginine residue. You can compare their peak uh, relative abundance. So um, this general idea, you can actually extend it to look at both the cell culture, but also uh, the animal uh, feeding, for example, the Silac mouse, you can feed the uh, um, animal with a heavy isotope incorporation. So when we look at the MS1-based uh, labeling, you can generate these kind of a isotope clusters. And for each of these um, at the LC retention time at each point, you can align them the light and heavy. So you generate actually several of these uh, SILAC ratios. You can take the medium and get a very accurate measurement of these relative abundance. So there are a great deal of advantage of doing SILAC in that you can do in vivo labeling, and this is MS1 based quantification. So there are very limited interference and you can uh, do this with very high accuracy. Some of the drawback or limitation obviously is that for any of these uh, peptides you introduce either uh, the heavy one or sometimes if you do triple uh, sample comparison, the medium, so increase your MS1 complexity. So imagine if you're working with very complex proteomic sample, this could really add a lot more uh, mass spectral complexity. And so that uh, because of that, it also relatively uh, limit your multiplexing capacity. So to overcome this issue, actually Professor Kuhn's lab has the, been the first one to really recognize that uh, people can use uh, this effect, uh, this uh, phenomenon called mass defect. So in that, so you have different neutron energy, binding energy difference from heavy and light version of each element. There's small mass uh, energy different, neutron binding energy difference can be translated obviously to the small mass difference, and this can be uh, resolved with high resolving uh, mass spectrometer. So based on this idea, <clears throat> this neutron encoding amino acids, for example, if we think about a two plus Dalton lysine, and so the Kuhn lab has come up with six different ways that you can build this lysine molecules to so think about adding two neutrons. So you could have two uh, M15 or one carbon-13, one uh, M15 and some different number of deuterium. So based on this, you can actually generate six different isotopologs. They are not exactly the same in their mass. There's a tiny uh, mass difference. And so uh, in looking at a plus eight Dalton lysine, they're actually theoretically can create 21 different isotopologs that span from the light and the heaviest uh, that actually uh, for uh, 36 uh, millidalton. So here, if we take this, the lightest version of these uh, isotopologs and the heaviest isotop, uh, isotopologs for this lysine, and this happened to be commercially available. So you can actually culture this, uh, two different uh, cells in these two different media and uh, lyse the cell and extract proteins and follow by digestion and run LCMSMS. So in the regular uh, resolving power, you don't actually resolve actually or uh, realize there's this, uh, this uh, peak splitting. And after you turn on 
high resolution, like a 120,000. So you can actually see it as kind of a red and green. So that allows you to separate or relative quantify these. Um, so this is the new code style like approach. And now we can see some uh, real data in this, uh, I believe it's in the East South culture. And you can see again in the uh, particular scan in the MS1 that is 30,000 resolving power, the precursor isolation, there's uh, just like behave as a single peak. And then you can do iron trap MS MS acquisition uh, to get identification. And if we insert this high resolution MS1 quantification at uh, 120,000 resolving power, all of a sudden you actually review these peak splitting that really allows you to absolutely quantify uh, with very high accuracy to quantify the relative abundance. So the Kuhn lab has taken this to uh, make it to uh, work in nine plex new cold uh, silic and they've also commercialized both of these chemical reagent for uh, and also the uh, mouse feed for people who want to do silic uh, mammalian tissue samples. So next I want to uh, switch gear to talk more about chemical labeling because sometimes you may not have the ability to culture cells or uh, feed an animal like to, to do this kind of uh, animal feeding. So and certainly chemical labeling give you a lot more flexibility in terms of the sample uh, versatility you can work with tissue samples or biofluid. So the very first uh, chemical tag uh, development uh, from Rudy Abasol lab led by Steve Gigi was the isotope coded affinity tag chemistry or ICAT. And so here shows the generic structure of the ICAT. So you have a uh, cysteine <clears throat> reactive group, sulfur hydro group, and then the linker region is where you install stable isotope to add these mass difference. And then the affinity label in here is the biotin with evidin label that allows you to uh, separate or enrich these samples. So this quantification is actually uh, labeling occurring at the protein level. So you can target cysteine containing uh, proteins in this uh, two protein extracts. And then after combined with the, uh, the ICAT version of sulfur, uh, the uh, chemical tagging, and then with the affinity uh, purification and then digestion with MSMS. So you can see the area under curve, the light and heavy for relative abundance and MSMS for, uh, uh, for protein identification. And one thing that you I want to bring up is this ICAT reagent could be pretty bulky. So that could also add uh, or require higher uh, uh, energy for the CID experiments. However, there are some advantages obviously for the ICAT labeling is that will help to greatly reduce your sample complexity of the digested mixture because we have this affinity purification and also only target cysteine containing peptides. And there are probably less than 10% of the peptides that contain cysteine. And this also adds the specificity for database search. So you can constrain uh, all your uh, peptide identification that contain cysteine only. And this would allow you to quantify uh, proteins or peptides based on isotope ratio and uh, MSMS identification. As I mentioned, one of the limitation is that the, the larger size of the ICAT reagent and also it only allows uh, cysteine containing proteins being identified and quantified. So to turn to more generic chemical labeling, perhaps and also more, a much more cheaper and economic is the uh, dimethyl labeling. And so this is obviously a very uh, simple and fast reaction and target. So this was formaldehyde <clears throat> that target was primary amine in the presence of uh, a reducing reagents such as sodium salt and borohydride or boring pyridine. So that forms in the light version. There's a dimethyl uh, adux of 28 Dalton. And <clears throat> in the media, you can use the deuterium, deuterium version of formaldehyde. And then there's uh, the heavy version would introduce the carbon-13 deuterated uh, formaldehyde in the presence of sodium uh, cyanobor deuteride. So this would give rise to 36 Dalton mass shift. So with this kind of a chemical labeling, you can create uh, a tri uh, triplex labeling scheme to quantify two sets, uh, three sets of samples. So showing here again is a uh, looking at a doubly charged triptych peptides. And so here, if you look at this particular peptide, it has C-terminal as the lysine. So that actually adds two different 
labels because it uh, this formaldehyde target was the primary mean uh, was the uh, amino group. So that would introduce and here is the double charge. You can see there are eight Dalton uh, mass shift between the light intermediate and heavy. And as you can see the area under extracted ion chromatogram, they actually co-elute pretty well in the LC retention time. So next, I, obviously this allows you to do a binary or triple, uh, <clears throat> triple sample. So there's a great need or motivation to further increase the multiplexing or the throughput. So there's some uh, motivation that I uh, kind of uh, listed here. One is that this will help us to reduce sample amount from any one sample, and it will also reduce the sample preparation and analysis time, especially if you're using uh, facility instrument that you're charged by the instrument time. If you can multiplex six, ten samples all together in a single LCMS run, that will actually greatly reduce the analysis and instrument time. And this would also improve the LCMS data overlap. And obviously, the major uh, motivation is this kind of a multiplexing allows you to look at a large number of biological conditions or replicates in a single experiment. For example, you can screen for multiple cell culture conditions, look at different drug treatment, or a large cohort of clinical specimens. So the very first, um, this kind of a multiplexing quantification scheme uh, come by this uh, eye track or isobaric tag for relative and absolute quantification. So showing here is the uh, eye track reagent, uh, the structure, the chemical structure, as you can see the NH ester that react with the primary amine, and there is a balance group, this carbonyl group, and then the reporter group, which is the cyclic ammonium ion that install, that allows install different stable isotopes at the reporter and the balance to allow the sum of these reporter and balance to be identical. That's why it's called isobaric. So the mass of this fourplex version uh, would be the same in the MS1 mode and the MSMS that cleave these two bonds. So this carbonyl group would lose uh, as a neutral loss. So this reporter ion is one down apart from each other. So you can actually relatively quantify them based on their uh, relative uh, intensity. So here shows basically the diagram with 114 to 117 reporter and then the opposite uh, for the the balancer, right? The, the lightest reporter would uh, paired with the heaviest balancer, so they will add together as the same in the MS1 mode. They will just behave as a single peptide or single sample, and then the MSMS allow you to do both identification and quantification. So just show a, a few quick example for triptych peptide in this case, and the precursor. Uh, MS1 and then the MSMS, you can see they just behave like a single peptide with the B and Y ions and then the low mass region to give you the relative abundance for these four sets of samples. In another example to show they have different reporter uh, ion abundance to allow you to do quantification, but again the B and Y uh, fragment would behave just like a single uh, peptide so one of the advantage for this isobaric labeling is that it can improve the sensitivity and fragmentation efficiency after labeling. So this is a comparison for the unlabeled versus the label. As you can see, there's a dramatic enhanced signal intensity for both of all the B and Y ions, and this would allow basically translate to more confident uh, peptide identification. So there are a number of advantages of this eye track reagents. Um, at first, it's, it's isobaric, and uh, it, as I mentioned, that it helps to enhance the sensitivity over mass difference uh, tag that where you spread the signal and now you combine all the signal in a single peak uh, for this peptide. And also, there's um, uh, ideally there's no difference in the chromatography illusion. Uh, so that's, that's the basis of when you do absolute or, or accurate quantification. And this would yield signal uh, signature reporter ion, and this would allow you to do simultaneous quantification and identification. Obviously, this comes with a high price uh, relative. This is actually still a few years back. Uh, probably this is going to cost a little more, but in general, you have this uh, uh, the high cost. So we actually think about whether we could develop a more cost effective 
uh, eye track alternative, but still offer a comparable uh, quantification performance. But before I introduce that uh, strategy, I want to also introduce another highly popular and successful commercial tag, and that is uh, isobaric tandem mass tag or TMT tags. So showing here is the chemical structure for a six flex version of the TMT. As you can see, again, the reporter from 126 to 131 done, uh, uh, apart from each other, and then the balancer. So you can label, for example, in this case, uh, six uh, mouse samples, and this also was the NH ester. So in the MS1 mode, there is no uh, actually spectral complexity introduced. The MS2 fragmentation um, that allows you to sequence peptides and then these uh, low mass region for relative abundance. So again, taking advantage of this mass defect uh, phenomenon, uh, thermal people actually have to create or enhance the quantification channel by taking advantage of, for example, if we swap the carbon-13 with an uh, M15, so there is a tiny mass difference, a six milliton mass difference that can be resolved with high resolution orbit trap type of instrument. So this would actually add additional uh, two channels and this uh, convert that original six plex to 10 plex version. So this is actually showing the 10 plex TMT. Again, the cleavage uh, happened at the uh, between the reporter ion and the balance group that you can actually generate these kind of a 10 plex uh, version for identification. Uh, and quantification. So more very recently, uh, Thermo has also released this, uh, um, the 12 as the 16 plex TMT Pro. So this is currently the highest uh, multiplexing uh, chemical reagents that is commercially available. So this is actually based on a tripeptide scaffold. So they use actually a modified proline as the reporter ion base and then was two beta alanine. So altogether, there are actually nine different heavy isotope positions, and this would generate or allow uh, essentially 16 uh, quantification channels. So this is actually a very recent development that is also commercially available. So back to our original question is whether we could uh, design similar kind of a chemical tags uh, that have similar performance, but we can synthesize or uh, made in uh, in-house in the lab with a fraction of cost. So based on this idea, if we compare the eye track and, and this uh, dimethylated amino acid labeling where we use uh, routinely for uh, chemical um, uh, uh, assist chemical uh, tagging assisted uh, de novo sequencing. What we have observed is this dimethylated amino ammonium ion can actually act as a reporter uh, group that we can actually utilize for quantification. So that's the, ba the basis where we can use dimethylated amino acids to kind of replace this, and we can synthesize them in a much lower cost. This is uh, the, the generation of the tag that we have developed is the dimethylated leucine for four channel, eight channel, and 12 channel. Uh, and, and more recently, we have developed a 21 plex. This uh, cost 60. So this is, um, in this case, uh, $23 for this uh, kind of a uh, uh, quantification. So then the question, obviously, there are 20 different amino acids when you design your chemical tags and which one that you want to select. So there are certain selection criteria we want to consider. One is that it hopefully it would be commercially available, uh, the isotopic amino acids, so there's no reliance on custom design, so that will uh, greatly reduce the synthetic cost and also make it a lot easier. And also we want to find the intense ammonium ion signal. So based on this criteria, we selected uh, leucine uh, as our ta target. So here shows our original design of the dimethylated leucine. Um, so here is the triazine ester uh, that can react with primary amine and the same carbonyl group as the balancer and then the reporter, which is the dimethylated leucine. So this would require only one or two step synthesis to generate this kind of a fourplex dilute tag. So this re uh, reporter is one dalton apart from each other from 115 to 118 and the MS2 fragmentation that allows us to basically relative quantify them and do uh, backbone cleavage for identification. As I mentioned, one of our 
goal to use this to look at uh, some of the low abundance neuropeptide uh, de novo sequencing as well as quantification. So this just shows that we can actually apply this for plaque dilute tag to look at the relative abundance, but also uh, these de novo sequencing to quantify these different samples. One uh, kind of a nice feature that we noted for this uh, dilute tag is that it also helps to enhance peptide uh, fragmentation. So this would really help uh, de novo sequencing. Uh, in this case, we compare the native or non-labeled versus the label. You can see a much greatly enhanced uh, A and B fragment uh, ions that help to uh, for us to do de novo sequencing. But obviously, one of our goals is to expand this to look at a more complex proteomic sample. So we can apply this to look at, for example, East Triptych uh, Digest. In this case, the top one is labeled in uh, aliquot 1 to 1 ratio, and the bottom is the 1 to 5, 2 to 10 ratio label. And you can see in the low mass region, the quantification accuracy is pretty uh, comparable to the uh, commercial tags and also pretty good. Uh, MSMS for identification. So obviously we also want to expand this to uh, higher throughput to more to increase, uh, increase the uh, quantification channel. So again, we turn to this mass defect phenomenon based on uh, Einstein energy equation, E equals mc square. So we can actually convert this um, low, uh, small neutron binding energy with the mass difference. So if we swap a single deuterium with a carbon-13, there is a 2.9 millidalton mass difference. So if we swap two of these, like that's our 116 reporter ions, or two of these deuterate, um, deuterium atom, uh, and change it to carbon-13, there is a 5.84 millidalton. So based on this idea, we can all of a sudden create uh, 12 uh, reporter ion, 12 plex dilute reporter ion that is differing from the original implementation by either 6, 12, or 18 millidalton. So this allows us to construct this uh, 12 plex dilute reagent. Um, and these uh, gray boxes are our original 4 plex re uh, dilute reagent. And now we can generate this 12 plex, for example, if you look at the M15, this 115 A and B, the only difference is the M15 uh, replaced by this carbon uh, 13. And so these are just color coded different isotopes. So to kind of summarize uh, this so called second generation of new code dilute tags, so we still have actually pretty compact chemical structure. And this is actually a very beneficial because it helps to improve the MSMS -MS identification, it doesn't require extensive or higher. Uh, collisional energy. In fact, it's actually required pretty low uh, CID energy to generate the reporter ion. And also because there's no need for uh, custom isotopic reagents, so we can actually synthesize them in large quantity with high uh, yield. So this just shows the uh, isotope configuration of these 12 plex reagents. So you may be wondering what kind of resolution that is needed to separate these uh, dilute tags. So we have a look at this uh, 116B and C, and this would require 20,000 resolving power. We have also systematically kind of evaluated different um, um, mass spectral resolving power from 15,000 to 240,000. And it turns out that at 30,000, 30K, that we can actually uh, baseline resolve all 12 uh, reporter ion channel. So that's obviously very readily available on all of the modern mass spectrometers, in per particular Orbitrap type of instrument, but even some of the high-end uh, QTOP based instrument. So, um, so we have uh, basically tried to apply this to look at more complex samples, the East Digest and the 12 plex reagent. As you can see, the low mass reporter ion in a uh, regular case, we just see it as four cluster peaks and with 60,000 resolving power, we can actually quantify them all together. So this box plot basically shows that we can actually have pretty good comparable uh, performance for quantitation accuracy. So you may be wondering, can we go further to further improve the quantification channel? And so the answer is yes, and we still actually rely on this very compact chemical structure uh, with the recognition that we can actually incorporate 
odd number of deuterium atoms at these different locations. So here, instead of the dimethylation, we can do monomethylation that will introduce nine additional channels and that uh, and highlighted here that basically still rely on a two, three step synthesis and we can generate this 21 plex uh, dilute channel uh, tax. So th for the smallest separation, uh, 115B and, and C, uh, which is only 2.92 milliDalton, and uh, that the required resolving power is 60,000. So showing on the bottom is uh, actually all 21 uh, plex channels. So for example, we have seven uh, variants of 118 a reporter ion and uh, 6, 117 and 5, 116 and uh, 3, 115 channels. So to again uh, apply this to a little more complex uh, human cell line, the K562 triptych cell line, say triptych digest. So again, in the low mass res uh, resolving power, you don't, there's just only four peaks. And then with the 60,000 resolving power, you can actually quantify all 21 channels. And again, the peptides still behave as a single sample. You can get pretty good uh, quantification and identification. So we just did a little bit kind of a uh, comparison for dilute labeled versus unlabeled to look at the general performance for this uh, tag. As we can see that it actually gets dilute labeled, gets pretty good uh, X correlation. The larger correlation means that we can actually identify things more confidently. And also this uh, in general favor, uh, the peptide lens between six to 10 amino acid and also has a slight increase or enhancement for the peptide charge state. And this would allow you to quantify about 99%. So quantification rate is pretty good. And we have also looked at the quantification ratio one to one and 15 to one, and also a larger number of these uh, PSMs to uh, look at the general performance. So to kind of summarize these isobaric tagging or MS2 based um, tagging, there's a number of advantages how, uh, for multiplexing and high throughput. However, there is actually one of the, the limitation is just co-isolation of precursor ion, especially when you have more complex uh, samples. And this could cause a uh, distorted reporter ion ratio. So there are some solutions in the field that, for example, either you, so this is basically showing that two of these are co-isolating. And so you can actually try to extend the LC gradient a couple with prefractionation or try to narrow precursor ion isolation or even adding additional gas base reaction. I think that Professor Kuhn's lab has done develop this uh, proton transfer reaction or using ion mobility separation to separate these co-isoluting, uh, co-eluting peptides. There's also a uh, more successful uh, and commercial version is the synchronous precursor selection MS3 based approach where you can uh, take or isolate multiple of these fragments to do a second third stage uh, MS3 and to uh, improve the quantification accuracy. So this strategy basically this uh, also kind of uh, advocate there is the, probably also some need to look at MS1 based quantification. So towards that end, we have also looked into using our dilute tag, even though it's developed as an isobaric MS2 based quantification, we could also utilize this to uh, do MS1 based quantification. And another consideration is that we can use this MS1 based quantification to combine proteome and metabolome analysis on a single analytical platform. Uh, so the idea is to, for example, if we work with uh, pancreatic cancer cell lysate and extract the proteins and metabolites separately and use the dilute labeling, because typical metabolite analysis using the analytical regular flow LCMS, so our goal here is to combine and do both of these uh, analysis on the nano flow LCMS. So based on the uh, dilute tag in here, the only difference is that we take advantage of this mass defect phenomenon where we can install uh, here the M15, carbon-13, and O18, or these uh, uh, four deuterium atoms, the light and heavy isotope label. So this would give rise to a duplex version of mass defect dilute that is differing from each other by 20.5 uh, millidalton.
So this can be actually resolved with high resolution mass spectrometer based on the area under curves that we're looking at uh, when you have high enough resolution. So you may be wondering what kind of resolution that you need for this MS1 based uh, quantification. So at the protein level, we realized for this particular triptych peptide, uh, the needed resolving power is 240,000. And for metabolites, we can do this in 120,000 uh, that we can actually separate both of these pretty nicely. And a kind of a nice feature for this uh, dilute labeling is that it can also help to improve the sensitivity for these amine containing metabolites. So what I'm showing you on this slide is the blue trace, it's the labeled cellular metabolites, as you can see, a much enhanced signal intensity, but also it helps the separation. So compared to free or non-labeled isoleucine and leucine, there is partial resolve, and then with the dilute labeling actually Im improve the retention time and uh, improve the separation. So this would help us to uh, apply this to look at, um, so this is actually a comparison of the MS1 based quantification and MS2 quantification to show comparable uh, kind of a, um, a performance. And also we have compared the labeled proteins and metabolites in the quantification accuracy and different uh, labeling ratio for the dynamic range. As one of the goal for this kind of experiments to try to combine both proteum and metabolism in the same analytical platform so we can actually compare, uh, perform the functional enrichment analysis to look at the cellular components and also the biological processes being uh, changed in both at the proteum and the metabolome level and then try to derive some of these overlapped, for example, the uh, CAC pathways that overlap between the proteum and metabolome. So this shows a number of these different uh, key metabolism pathways, such as the arginine proline metabolism pathway and glutathione metabolism pathway. So basically, I'm using this example to show that we can use the mass defect uh, dilute uh, tag to show to simultaneously or to parallel proteome and metabolome on the same nanofloy LCMS uh, platform. And this can also help to improve quantification accuracy and detection sensitivity. And I have probably two more minutes. I want to give one last example to show the MS1 based kind of quantification in an absolute or targeted quantification uh, uh, re uh, regime, which is the uh, targeted proteomics or mass spec. The, the golden standard is still the selected reaction monitoring or parallel reaction monitoring where we can couple that with the stable isotope encoded standards. However, there are some uh, limitations. One is that there is uh, in a, a complex sample, we may have lower specificity and also there's a limited analytical sample throughput. And um, when you have a complex sample like a biofluids, that oftentimes the target peptide could span a wide dynamic range. And if you just use a single point calibration, this could lead to inaccurate estimates. Um, so in um, our dilute kind of a, a portfolio, we also designed this kind of a mass difference or isotropic uh, dilute reagent where we can incorporate different number of uh, different numbers of deuterium atoms to create these three, uh, six, nine, and 12 Dalton uh, mass difference. So this is a five plex I dilute reagent still target the primary amine of a peptide. So this is actually showing the synthetic scheme with uh, one or two step synthesis that is pretty readily uh, done. And so the idea is that we can actually, instead of getting the very expensive stable isotope uh, encoded peptide uh, analog synthesized, we can actually take any uh, target peptide of interest and label them uh, with known concentration or uh, with a zero dilution, label them with four channels of dilute re I dilute reagent, and then spike them into your real sample that, um, that was your target analyte and the label was D0 to create this kind of a calibration curve. So based on this, we can, for example, with the I dilute to do a single run that you can quantify these different absolute quantification from 0.1 to 1,000 uh, fentanyl uh, for a neural peptide. But our idea is to perhaps to combine the mass difference label and our isobaric labeling to increase the throughput for absolute quantification. So if we examine this uh, fiveplex 
eye dilute reagent, we realized, and, and then compare this 12-plex dilute isobaric tag, we realized that these three channels are very similar to this um, um, 12-plex dilute isobaric tag with 145 Dalton. So we thought that maybe we can actually substitute the D3 channel with the 12-plex dilute isobaric tag. And so based on this idea, we can actually take four channels of the eye dilute uh, reagent and label this uh, target peptide with known concentration and spike them into our 12-plex dilute isobaric tag labeled real sample like cerebral spinal fluid because the I dilute and dilute share the same chemical structure, so they will co-elute in the LC uh, elution profile and perform absolute quantification. And this D0 labeled uh, dilute, I dilute channel can also act as a real-time trigger to trigger to look at the four Dalton mass shift to trigger the 12-plex dilute target peptide in MSMS, so it can toggle between low and high resolution to get relative quantification and the synchronous precursor selection MS3 to further improve uh, the quantification accuracy. So we applied this for uh, like a kind of a, uh, a proof of principle with a triptych peptide of a TTR peptide for the I dilute D0 and the 12-plex uh, dilute. So you can see they're co-eluting, they're isotopic cluster, they're four Dalton apart, MSMS align pretty well. And then we compi uh, compare this quantification accuracy one to one, one to two to five to 10 ratio. And then uh, the last week we just compared this top mag method with some more well-established parallel reaction monitoring or synchronous MS3. As you can see from this radar plot, the hot mag method had the smallest uh, uh, relative error at these different ratios and also shows pretty good linear dynamic range and also the relative uh, error. So finally, we just apply this to a real sample to look at the cerebral spinal fluid to perform absolute quantification of three of these uh, biomarkers, candidate biomarkers, APOE, transthyroidine, and VGF, uh, with the 22 uh, CSF samples collected from 11 preclinical Alzheimer disease and uh, 11 uh, controls. As you can see from the top is the linear dynamic range, and the bottom is the real uh, data analysis, you can see that the APOE, e, we have actually substantial down regulation with p value smaller than uh, 0.05, uh, and then the TTR and DGF. So, to kind of summarize, I hope I've shown you that for this part, we have uh, developed actually kind of a suite of this chemical tag, in particular focusing on dimethylated amino acid. So, depending on your goal of experiment, whether you want to perform absolute quantification, you can use just biplex I dilute, or relative quantification depending on the number of samples. If you have two samples or four or more, 12 or more samples, you can use this uh, isobaric tagging. So with that, I want to stop and also just thank, again, acknowledge uh, the P41 grant, in particular Josh, uh, for the leadership to um, build this uh, particular National Center and um, in the and thank you all for joining and for tuning in. I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Also, thank uh, people in my lab, um, Dustin, Xiaofang, and Qi, and all of you for your attention. Nice, thank you, Ling Jun. This is great. So we have a few questions that come up through the talk. Okay. Uh, one question is. Did I stop sharing, or how do I? Uh, up to you. Um, okay, well, you can ask, yeah, because I can see anybody. Yeah. You may want to show some of your slides. Uh, oh, okay. So I'll, I'll stay at this, yeah. Yeah, so there is a one question is, uh, is the is the isotope tagging uh, strategy compatible with the non-denaturing work? So if somebody wants to study biofluids, without denaturing their proteins. Could they use the tagging for that? Oh, I see. OK, so at the protein level, right? So for labeling, yes, there are certain, uh, as I mentioned, the chemical tag can work with both the protein level and also the peptide, I would say. And even uh, people have shown, like, for example, with formaldehyde labeling, dimethyl labeling, uh, people have developed strategies to look at at a protein level. Uh, one thing, and certainly I would say probably more optimization would be required 
because one thing is that the labeling efficiency at the protein level oftentimes is not as good as at the peptide level, obviously, because you have more accessible of these lysine residue uh, for for these uh, labeling approaches. Um, and, but I think the short answer is it's possible. Uh, you just have to kind of optimize and tune the labeling condition. And another uh, consideration is also to try to avoid some of these site re reactions if you over label. And, and so those are the things that uh, people need to be uh, more, I guess, pay more attention to. Great, thank you. Uh, then there is a another question is about your work uh, combining proteomics and metabolomics workflows. What mm -hmm. kind of the question is? Uh, what kind of column did you use for that work, and uh, what are the major metabolite identifications you got? Yes, this is a great question. So for that particular example, so we're our goal is to still using the nanoflow. So it's a C eighteen column, actually self packed. Uh, nanoflow C C18 column, and uh, you know, because in general for metabolites we use either uh, regular analytical flow or helix column or other type of column that um, is not compatible with our proteome workflow. So our goal is to try to combine the two. But obviously, the question is, is um, asking about what type of metabolites. I would say for the dilute labeling. Um, uh, regime obviously were limited with just the amine containing metabolites. So that means that we're losing uh, with this particular workflow, losing these other uh, metabolites. However, there are other bait like a non-targeted metabolites or um, like, for example, derivatizing the carboxylic acid or other functional group. We can also harvest these other metabolites. But from uh, this particular experiment, we primarily generate a lot of these amino acid or metabolism based and also as I've shown some of these glutathione in in other uh, nucleic acid uh, metabolism uh, pathway. Nice, awesome, thank you. I think we have time for one more question, one last question. So for, uh, for it, oh, this one is uh, uh, also about uh, tagging. Uh, how do you control the number of uh, deuterium label uh, labels in the molecule, like deuterium-3, deuterium-6, deuterium-9, whatever, in one of the figures. I'm not sure which figure it's referring to. Does uh, you, you know which one? Um, yeah, I think I think I uh, let me see why it have looks like I have. Come. Yeah, I think I. I think there's this one example right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, that looks yeah. correct. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. So so this is right here. Uh, because there are some of these commercially available leucine. So, so here we're basically using the dimethylated loose, uh, the loose commercial available isotopic leucine. And then with this different, as I've shown right here, the formaldehyde, some of these light version, but there are also the deuterium version. And there's also commercially available sodium di uh, borono, uh, deuteride so you can actually so these are also and then with the deuterated water so you can actually control this very uh, precisely and there is uh, the reaction is also very fast only 30 minutes so that um, that's how we can generate these ta uh, tags that basically we don't need to rely on you know like a peptide synthesis facility to get those very expensive isotope encoded uh, standards yes Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lin Jun, for the great presentation. Oh, thank you very much for having me and for moderating. Yeah, because I can't thank see anything. So I appreciate you <laughs> relaying all the questions. <laughs> Thanks. So how do I go about stop sharing? Should should we up the right? Uh, you would have to go back to Teams. Oh yeah. Okay, you're done. You're good. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>